Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Christopher Van Kaufman. And this is the podcast for April 7th, 2023, Good Friday. Uh, and our text in the Narrative Lectionary this year for Good Friday is Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 through 61. It's a very long reading. Uh, we would suggest, uh, I think, as we have in the past, that Perhaps you might consider breaking it up. Uh, you know, you you could do a couple of different things, probably more than that. You could have different voices uh, reading, you know, have someone uh, read the part of the crowds and uh, someone read, um, you know, the part of the centurion uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, like the, stuff like that. Or you could read uh, part of the text and then preach on that and then read the next part of the text and preach on that. Mm -hmm. That was uh, often Craig Kester's um, suggestion, which is a good suggestion as well. So uh, in any case, uh, probably don't have your congregation stand for this whole <laughs> <laughs> this whole uh, reading uh, just because they're going to be thinking more about how much they want to sit down rather than listening to the story. But that's all logistical. You uh, you all will figure that out, of course. Uh, but the text, of course, is the passion narrative. We begin uh, in verse 27 with the, um, the soldiers mocking Jesus as king of the Jews. This is uh, similar to what we talked about in Palm Sunday, the text for Palm Sunday, where uh, Jesus was depicted as a king or a conquering king. Uh, emperor or, or king coming into Jerusalem. Um, uh, here, uh, the, the soldiers hail him as king of the Jews. Mockingly, they put uh, a crown of thorns on him, uh, a, a reed as a scepter, and put a scarlet robe around him. And then, of course, uh, they nail um, a charge uh, over his head on the cross, which says, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Yeah, this is a good point, I think, where we could interject quickly and talk about irony and narrative irony. Because in the modern day, irony is often thought of as akin to sarcasm or kind of mocking. But this is one of those places where what we see is people, and we see this, saw this earlier in some senses with Palm Sunday, but we see people saying the truth without knowing that they are speaking the truth. Yeah. And that's one of the things Matthew wants to show us in this section. That Jesus is indeed king, and these people are kneeling and hailing him as king without knowing how true those words are. We call that narrative irony. I think it's a powerful part of Matthew's presentation here. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. So they speak the truth even though they don't know it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And it continues, right? He, uh, I'm looking at verse 42. Um, the chief priests and the scribes and elders say he saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. Um, so, and and it's not, not just the chief priests and the elders, the religious authorities. It's the two uh, bandits, the NRSV calls them, who are crucified on either side of him, uh, who mock him as well and, and, just common passers-by. This is a this is a public display, right? A public display of imperial power on the roadside, or just you know where where people are just passing by um, to serve as a warning uh, to to passers-by, right? Not to not to do the same thing. Yeah, and it's important because in especially in twenty twenty three. The crucifixion of Jesus is just about the only crucifixion we ever talk about. It's important to know, and the, the two bandits here are a good example of this. Crucifixion was terribly and unfortunately common in the Roman world. You know, we have reports from uh, Judea even of hundreds being crucified uh, during rebellions. And so this is something that the, the first hearers of the story would have been intimately familiar with and would have been no less shocking because they were familiar with it in the sense that they knew what it was to walk past and see someone crucified mm -hmm. by the side of the road. And I think we should not forget that yeah. when we think about this, the, the imagery that Matthew is using in this story. I think about, there's a, there's a Midrash uh, or a rabbinic uh, comment 
on the sacrifice of Isaac or what, what Jews call the, the binding of Isaac, uh, Genesis 22, right? Where Abraham uh, is tested by God. And uh, uh, the, the, the point that the rabbis comment on related to this is uh, in Genesis 22, it says that um, Abraham places the wood of the sacrifice on Isaac uh, and they leave the servants to go up to Mount Moriah and uh, the rabbis say Isaac carries the wood of his own sacrifice, just as a crucified man carries the wood of his cross. And it, mm. and they were not referring to Jesus, right? <laughs> They're referring, as you said, to the all too common uh, phenomenon of uh, of crucifixion, which was horribly yeah, common in those days. Yeah, and that, that point about carrying the cross is, goes back to that point about the, the fact that this is meant to be a public humiliation. And the, the reason why they go to this place called Golgotha, which is a hill, is they take them to a place where they will be seen, mm. where people who pass by will see what it is that's going on. And it goes back again to that that narrative irony that what the Romans intend as a public humiliation is for Matthew also Jesus' glorification mm. and the sign of who Jesus truly is. And so again, Matthew's kind of turning this whole thing on its head within this passion narrative. And we see this a little bit as we get further in the narrative with some of the quotations from the Old Testament as well. Well, one of those, of course, is uh, Eli Eli Lama Sabachthani, which is a quotation uh, directly from Psalm 22, verse 1, right? My God, my God, Eli, Eli, uh, why have you forsaken me, Lama Sabachthani? Jesus um, laments <laughs> from the cross. I think if you so desire in the in the sermon, our preachers might comment that um, this kind of lament, which is so common uh, in the Psalms and in Job and in Lamentations, mm -hmm. is a faithful form of prayer, and that Jesus Himself engages in it. Uh, this this um, form of prayer where you're where you're voicing, you know, uh, questions to God. I think Christians are too often hesitant to do that, uh, and it's. Um, Perhaps not the main point of the sermon, but perhaps uh, something worth saying in the sermon that that Jesus sets an example that that this kind of lament, this kind of prayer, is a faithful form of prayer. Mm -hmm. And and then of course Psalm twenty two provides a lens right through which uh, the um, the Matthew uh, sees uh, the the crucifixion, and not just in Matthew, of course, right? Dividing uh, his clothes among them, uh, mm -hmm. and um, other uh, allusions to Psalm twenty two. Yeah, yeah, and it's an extraordinarily important psalm in the early church, and one of the reasons for it is it's seen. It is a psalm of lament, no doubt, uh, but it is seen again, kind of paradoxically by the early church also as a messianic psalm. Mm -hmm. And in two particular ways. One is that in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Psalms, there's a reference to the lamenter's hands and feet being pierced, mm -hmm. which the church fathers saw as a reference to the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. But it's also, again, just as Matthew is showing, it's a psalm of reversal because yes. it starts with lament but ends with and I will uh, tell of the deeds of the Lord to a generation yet unborn, the idea that the deeds of God are so great that they have to be uh, proclaimed in perpetuity or to unborn generations. So that same kind of reversal, if we see it as a lens, is perhaps part of what is being referenced in this, in this instance. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. So it's not just the lament, it's also the, the praise that begins um, right in the midst of the psalm. Uh, I'm looking at Psalm 22 now. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild ox, and you have rescued me. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. Um, 
you know, uh, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. And as you said, ends with proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Uh, so yeah, uh, the the reference to the first verse of the psalm is not just lament, but encompasses the praise that, um, and that, as you say, the reversal that happens in the midst of the psalm. Some mm -hmm. scholars, it's such an abrupt uh, reversal that some scholars say it's two different psalms kind of smushed together, but I, I don't think that that's true. I think, uh, you know, the, the fact that from the, you know, while the psalmist is on the metaphorical or uh, literal horns of the wild oxen, uh, he begins to sing praises because he knows that God has, and the Hebrew actually isn't rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen, you have answered me, is what the Hebrew says, actually. So, you know, even in the midst of um, the, you know, <laughs> on the horns of the wild oxen, uh, even on the cross, um, Jesus, uh, God has answered, God has, God has heard, God is present, even in the midst of that. Let's talk a bit about the, um, what happens uh, then after Jesus dies. Uh, we're looking at verse 50, Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And after his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. And the centurion, the Roman centurion, upon seeing all of this, was terrified uh, and said, truly, this man was God's son. A, 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 we, we talked about crucifixion as a kind of everyday occurrence, or at least a very common occurrence, in the ancient world. Uh, and yet he, here we see the cosmic significance of Jesus' crucifixion, right? The, the, the earth shakes, the curtain of the temple is torn into the dead, at least some of the dead rise. Uh, what, what do you make of that, Christopher? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things going on. As our colleague David Fredrickson would remind us, the presence of an earthquake is uh, would have been very, uh, well taken by a, a Roman soldier in the sense that uh, they thought of things like earthquakes as divine portents, mm. as a sign of, especially of divine disfavor, that an earthquake occurs because of uh, the anger of a god. And so for this Roman soldier, this is evidence that something has gone wrong, mm. that as he is watching this event take place, the fact that an earthquake occurs, this is evidence that... Uh, something has somebody has violated a god and in this case uh, matthew lets us know of course who that is and so uh, this i think was uh, part of it i think there's also though on the old testament side because as we've reminded our listeners throughout this matthew is very interested in showing how jesus fits into the patterns and the the narrative of the old testament that as we talked about with the prophets, one of the things that the prophets share together is the way in which they come about and they preach their message before destruction, before mm. the destruction of the northern kingdom by Assyria, before the deportation to Babylon. And in this case, we have very soon in the future, the destruction of the temple and the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans. And I think, especially when we think about the temple curtain being torn, is again a portent, a an omen of the the reality of what happens when prophecy is rejected. Mm. That uh, there is this very strong connection between rejection of prophecy and destruction by empire, and so I think that that's one of the things that's going on here as well. And. We end, of course, uh, with the burial uh, in the tomb. The uh, the women are there uh, from a distance, but they follow Jesus, uh, and they, um, and, the, and also Joseph of Arimathea, uh, who's also a disciple of Jesus. So it ends certainly with this cosmic uh, cataclysm and uh, the the sorrow of the crucifixion, um, but it ends with these notes, right? Truly this man was God's son. 
mm -hmm. and and the disciples who are still uh, both both women and men who are caring for Jesus' body. Uh, I, I like how uh, our commentator Warren Carter puts it at the end of his commentary. He says, it looks like Roman power has won. Appearances, though, can be deceptive. So mm -hmm. uh, we move forward now uh, with all the solemnity uh, of Good Friday uh, with some uh, foretaste of the joy to come in Easter.